أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خير الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبي إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وعجل الله وتعالى فرج صاحب الزمان والعن أعداء الدين إلى قيام يوم الدين Brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, <coughs> One of the questions that often, or sometimes at least, comes to mind is, um, is the month, the holy month of Sha'ban, is it holy because uh, because Imam Mahdi السلام, was born in that month? Or was he born in that month because it was holy? So what, what came first? Why is the month of Sha'ban uh, such a holy month? Um, you know, perhaps understanding one thing about the holy month of Sha'ban could give us a glimpse into an answer for this question, which is, why is it that the 15th of Sha'ban, the day on which we celebrate the, the birth of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, ajallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif why was it celebrated by Muslims? Sunnis and Shias, before um, Imam Mahdi alayhi salam was born, you find, you know, a group as a Sunni, and you find that, you know, even Sunnis, learned Sunnis throughout the ages, considered the 15th of Shaban holy. And when we look at the 15th of Shaban, we don't find any other occasion that makes it such a holy day, aside from the fact that it is the birth date of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. You know, we look at the month of Ramadan, the holy month of Ramadan, we find there are many, many occasions throughout the month. And inshallah, we'll speak about that, hopefully, inshallah, in this in next lecture. Um, the, month of, the month of Shaban, however, the 15th of Shaban, Muslims celebrated it from the time of the Prophet and we have Sunni and Shia narrations that say it's a holy day, fasting the day is, is, a, is a very blessed thing, uh, keeping up the night the night before in worship and prayers is a very good thing. See, Imam Mahdi السلام, plays such a pivotal role in our faith as Muslims that it has steep roots in the Qur'an, uh, excuse me, that Imam Mahdi السلام, and his role have steep roots in the Qur'an. And in fact, in previous scriptures, the Qur'an, the Holy Qur'an, um, gives us examples of all the prophets and their stories. And of course, as Muslims, we are required to Look at these stories and contemplate them. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Tadabur of the Qur'an is when you read it and you reflect on it. What does this mean? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this story or that story in the Qur'an? And how come this story, for instance, we have many stories of Musa alayhi salam. How come the stories are, are mentioned, but every time they're mentioned a little differently? What's the moral of that instance of the story in the Holy Quran. If we do that, then we have what emerges is really the importance of uh, the role of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam and the foundational importance of the role of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam in Islam. And in fact, in previous religions as well. You know, it's a very simple, we can just do a very simple uh, study or research on other faiths. The idea of a man who would come at the end of times or towards the end of times, the end of times is when everybody had tried to lead humanity into salvation or, excuse me uh, for using that term, it's not a Muslim term, it's a Christian term, but uh, lead humanity into um, harmony and peace. Uh, Greek mythology 
speaks about uh, utopia, a city where no crimes are committed, uh, there is no um, poverty, no disease, no wars. Um, that ultimate city is humanity. It would be one city. If you look at all other faiths, and let's focus just for a minute on Abrahamic faiths, we find that Judaism anticipates the coming of the Messiah. Of course, they reject Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, as being the Messiah, but they still very much believe that a Messiah would come where after uh, some trials and tribulations, peace would prevail uh, in a way that they perceived that peace to be. Christianity believed, believes, rightly so, that Jesus, the son of Mary, was that prophet, uh, promised Messiah. And they believed that he's not here and that he will come back to establish or to found that utopian society that we speak of. And when you look at different sects in Christianity, you find some descriptions, especially in you know, Jehovah Witnesses and some other sects, they describe that utopia in almost exactly identical terms unto how Muslims describe it. No wonder there, because you know, all two faiths, actually three faiths, came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So any variations that you'd see are variations that came about because of the interpretations or misinterpretations of the adherence of those religions. If you look at the, uh, the Bible itself in the Old Testament, I believe it was in Irmia, where the Bible talks about an event um, of a leader who is the master of the soldiers who will take revenge for the sacrifice that was committed or the massacre that was committed by the river Euphrates. I wrote about this in my book uh, in Arabic about the Bible. And I came to the conclusion after some analysis that it can be no one else but Imam Mahdi alayhi and other scholars had reached reach the same conclusion. Now, <clears throat> the idea of a promised person, whether the Messiah alayhi salam or someone else, is truly steeped in the Quran. I want to give you one example that we read often, but we should contemplate more. And that is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the prophets, where he says, and when your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when your Lord took an oath from all the prophets and from you, that when the prophet comes, that you all should believe in him. In another occurrence where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is speaking to Musa alayhi salam and Musa makes dua, Ya Allah, inna hudna ilayk, we have been guided into you. Ya Allah, basically make us the best nation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, no, my mercy has been written for those, Allah speaking to Musa, for those who follow an nabi al-Ummi, that is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So all prophets, Musa, Isa, Ibrahim, um, all of them, Ismail, Ishaq, all of them bar none. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he took an oath from them to believe in a future prophet. And that prophet is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I believe it's in Exodus in the Old Testament where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a prophet who will come from the cousins of the Jews, the cousins or the, the cousins of the descendants of Isaac, Ishaq alayhi salam. And with little analysis, and if you, again, if you read, you know, my writings and other writings, you find that it's, it's talking about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa In addition, <clears throat> you find in the Old Testament also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a promise to Ibrahim, that he will bring from the offspring 
of Ismail, 12 Imams. Interestingly enough, the, the common translations of the Bible into, into English started translating 12 princes into Ruasa presidents or leaders. But you find that the older, a bit older, 50s and before translations, they actually referred to them as imams. So in the Bible it says, Ismail salam, Allah will bring off forth from him 12 imams who will dwell forever, dwell with humanity basically forever. And many other instances in the Old Testament and New Testament that we readily can see that speak about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Imams in the New Testament. Some people ask, well, how about the New Testament in John, you know, 14 through 16? Uh, Isa alayhi salam tells his followers, I must go for if I, gonna, if I do not go, the comforter or Percletus will not come and Allah will send or God will send uh, or the, the, the Holy Spirit. If I do not go, the Holy Spirit will not come or the Holy Spirit will be with him or according to some interpretations, common uh, Trinitarian Christian interpretations, uh, that that comforter is the Holy Spirit. And of course, with quick analysis, we find that that's the wrong interpretation because the Holy Spirit was with uh, Jesus, with Isa alayhis salam, before. In fact, before he was born, both Muslims and Christians agree to that. So why does the Bible make it a condition for Jesus to have to go so that the Holy Spirit would come. In addition to the fact that the Bible itself talks about him, this comforter, speaking the truth, he will dwell with you forever. And how does he dwell? How does Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dwell with us forever? Well, according to the, to the Torah, or according to Jewish tradition, that a man lives on forever through his offspring. And so that applies to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa so the questions that now that we have to, to you know, answer, or we should answer, are questions around Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. You know, we get from um, uh, our Muslim brothers who are not on the right path with us as Shias. They say, well, you know, it's strange that somebody would live for over a thousand years when we tell them that Imam Mahdi alayhi salam is alive. And I find that to be strange. Because we as Muslims, all of us, believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first told us about Nuh alayhi salam, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَبِتَ فِي قَوْمِهِ He stayed in his, in his, within, with his people 950 years. And tradition tells us that he lived for around 2,000 years. Nuh alayhi salam. No, there is nothing strange about that. Allah made it happen. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other one is Khidr alayhi salam. Khidr alayhi salam, there is consensus between uh, mainstream Muslims, whether Shias and Sunnis, that Khidr alayhi salam is a prophet. Some say that he was an imam, but I believe he was a prophet. Who had been alive, according to Sunni tradition, he was a leader of one of the armies of the Qarnayn. And that he found the spring of life, he drank from it, and that he lives on forever. Whether that's true or not, there is consensus that he's alive. And we encounter him in Surah Al-Kahf. When Musa alayhi salam comes to him, he learns, you know the story, and I will run through it quickly because I'm supposed to speak for about half an hour only. So Musa alayhi salam, after he spoke to Allah, or Allah spoke to him on the mountain, Musa alayhi salam thought to himself, he thought to himself, he actually didn't say it to anybody. He said, who's like me? I am, I, I have to be the greatest person was alive because I spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What an honor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salam to him and he said, he told him to tell him, uh, Musa, there is one person who is more knowledgeable than you on this earth. So Musa asked about some signs where he could find him. Immediately Musa went to his first imam. Now remember, Musa alayhi salam had the first imam in, in the first stage of his life was Harun alayhi salam. Harun was older than Musa, but he was the first imam after Musa. So he was to Musa like Ali was to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad al-Mu'alihi wa 
But Harun alayhi salam died before Musa. So Musa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him who the next imam is. Not that Musa chose the imam, but Allah told him that Musa, the imam after you is Yosha ibn Nun, uh, Joshua in the Bible. He's buried in Jordan in the city of Salt on the mountains. And I had the honor of visiting his shrine there. So Musa alayhi salam uh, tells Joshua, who was young, Fata. That means he was strong. The word Fata in Arabic denotes strength and um, uh, somebody who's in their prime. He said to his Fata, Yosha, get us some food. We are going to travel. I don't care if it takes us tens of years until I find this man who's more knowledgeable from me. For what purpose? So Musa can learn from him. Not challenge him, but learn from him. And so they traveled. On the way, they find a rock. They, they take a nap on the rock. And when they wake up, they walk away. While they were taking a nap, part of the food that they prepared for them was a fish, a dead fish, obviously. When they walked away, Musa alayhi salam tells Joshua that, hey, we're hungry. Give us some of our food. So Joshua tells Musa alayhi salam, he said, I forgot to tell you that when we were asleep, the water that we slept by, that rock, there was some water by it, touched, some of it touched the fish, and the fish came back to life and swam away. Musa alayhi salam said, that's, هذا ما كنا نبغ. That's what we have been going after, what we have been seeking. They looked exactly where step, they stepped until they found the rock, and there where they found Khidr alayhi salam. The role that Khidr alayhi salam played in that story in Surah Al-Kahf, brothers and sisters, is a story for us to know our Imam alayhi salam and his role in our world. How so? Musa alayhi salam, who was one of Ulil Azm, tells Khidr, he says, I came to follow you so I can learn something from you. Khidr alayhi salam tells Musa, one of the greatest prophets and messengers of all times, he said, you can't. Musa, Musa, you cannot follow me. You will not be able to bear what I do because you haven't been given that kind of knowledge that I have. Musa salam, was given a, a total, complete, full law by which humanity can live at that time. And it's a law from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet Khidr salam, tells him, I, I, Allah gave me special knowledge that you cannot bear. So Musa begs him, that, that highlights the importance of knowledge for us, that we should beg, we should listen to knowledge, we should gain knowledge from its sources, uh, even if we have to beg somebody like Musa alayhi salam, begging somebody else to teach him, to teach him some of that knowledge. Then they start walking. The first thing that Khidr alayhi salam does was to puncture a boat, a fishing boat. Now, listen to this. Musa alayhi salam objects to Khidr alayhi salam. He says, uh, Khidr, this property belonged to somebody else. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. Property of others has sanctity that a private like Musa alayhi salam would stand up for. He said, how dare you do that? It's, it's for people. It belongs to people and you punctured it. Khidr alayhi salam says, Musa, didn't I tell you you wouldn't be able to bear what I do? So Musa alayhi salam said, forgive me, give me another chance. So they walk, they find some young children playing. One of them was, according to tradition, a 10-year-old boy. The Quran tells us, Ghulam. So clearly the tradition is consistent with the ayah. 10 years old, they were playing. Khidr alayhi salam comes and kills him. Musa alayhi salam now is immensely shaken. He says, Khidr, how could you kill an innocent soul like that? لَقَدْ جِئْتَ شَيْءًا imra, Something that is a great calamity. How dare you do that? Khidr alayhi salam again says, uh, you can't bear what I'm telling you. Um, I, I had a story that I would like to share with you. One time I was uh, at the university. The chairman of the department uh, asked me to join him in his office. Uh, I came in and he kind of halfway shut the door and he said, he said, you know, last night a, a professor at the university gave a lecture where he criticized the Quran and he said, the Quran in this story says 
that justifies the killing of a 10 year old boy. And he said, uh, you know, how do we, how do you answer that? I said, you know, Musa alayhi salam knew, had a law and that law is the law that Isa alayhi salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ibrahim, all of them had, which is you do not kill an innocent soul. You do not attack others' property. You do all the things that we're used to in, in law. But what Khidr alayhi salam had was a special law commission, where he was commissioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to execute that knowledge, to execute that law on events, on people, on property that we interact with. But it wasn't for anybody else to take that law, not even Musa alayhi salam. So Musa alayhi salam, if it wasn't for his contract with Khidr not to ask questions, was 100% right to object and say, how could you kill an innocent soul? And I said, the, the, the moral of the story for us, to the chairman, the moral of the story to us is not of killing an innocent soul. I said, continue the story. The story when Khidr alayhi salam, and I'm jumping ahead, explained it to Musa that Allah gave Khidr special knowledge that this 10-year-old boy, if he grew up, he would be a criminal, he would be um, disobedient to his parents, and he would end up in the hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave special permission, in fact, commissioned Khidr alayhi salam to go and kill this boy and replace him with a daughter or two daughters. So the moral of the story here, as I was telling the chairman, is I want to ask you a question, Mr. Chairman. I was a friend of mine, by the way, great great friend. Uh, and the moral of the question is, let's say that you and I are standing right here. Rewind time. And Hitler comes walking and he's 10 years old. And you have 100% certainty. You know for, fa for a fact, you have absolutely indisputable knowledge that Hitler will grow older. He will become a leader, a, a, a nasty Nazi leader who will kill, and this is the example I told him, who will kill 6 million Jews. Will you kill him or not to save 6 million Jews? Uh, the chairman actually was completely mesmerized and said, my God, I see it. That's the special knowledge that hidden, uh, special, hidden or concealed worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, commissioned by Allah only, can or that have. They can change the law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent or overrule the law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to a prophet because Allah commissioned them to do, to do so. Anyway, the story continues on where Khidr alayhi salam goes and, you know, erects a wall that, that had, was demolished uh, and it was for some orphans who would grow up uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and retrieve a, a treasure that was covered under there. I asked when I was in Qom, I asked my teacher, I told Subhani, I said, uh, I told Subhani, what, what is the role of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam in our world now? He's concealed. He is not absent. Ghaib doesn't mean absent. Imam Mahdi alayhi salam is with us. We just don't recognize him. Like Khidr alayhi salam was with people, but they didn't know his role. His, his name to other people could have been anything but Khidr. Could have been something that people don't know. But yet he interacted with the world that he interacted. And uh, I told him, Subhani, he told me, he said, Abu Muhammad, it's in the Quran. I said, don't you see it? I said, well, Allah, to be honest with you, I don't. Show it to me. He said, the story of Al-Kahf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put that story of Khidr in Surah Al-Kahf to show us how Allah is certain of Allah's creation. Allah chooses them for mysterious, concealed, roles that we do not see, but they affect the outcomes of humanity. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do it that way? Who knows? It's Allah's wisdom. Why does Allah send Musa alayhi salam and have him go through, you know, all the different stories that he did? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send Isa alayhi salam the first time and he brings him back the second time? 
Why did, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the 6th century common era and not now, for instance? Those are things that Allah knows. Why he does things the way he does? This is Allah's business, brothers and sisters. We submit. Now we can try to analyze. There is no, there is nothing wrong with trying to analyze and the answers are all in the Quran, but we're blind to them. That's the problem. The life, the length of life is something that I find our uh, uh, Sunni brothers and sisters objecting to it. I find that to be absolutely strange because Nuh alayhi salam, Khidr alayhi salam are there. Other humans, you know our Sunni brothers, I remember growing up with these stories. Sunni brothers believe that the false messiah, Al-Awr al-Dajjal, is in a cave on an island, chained to the wall of the island, and that some of the companions, Ibn Hussein, for instance, and others, they went there, they, they got lost, they had a shipwreck, they got into the island, they walked into the cave. It's a complicated story. They get into the cave, they see this man chained, and he starts asking questions, and he said, did Muhammad come? And they say, yes. He said, well, my time is not far from now. So they get back, you know, they make their way back to uh, the Prophet وسلم, and they tell him about what happened. And he said, yes, that is a Dajjal who lives and he had been alive for a while and he lives on and he will live until the, the second coming of Isa السلام, and then he will fight Imam Mahdi. Now our Sunni brothers accept this story. They accept it. They mention it in their... Juma khutbah in their speeches, in their lectures, as if it's a given, it's a given fact. And I'm not going to argue with them. But the question that I have for them is, our brothers, why do you accept somebody who is evil at the Dajjal, the false messiah? Why do you accept him and accept long life for him? And you all know that he's a human being. But when it comes to the descendant of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our prophet and your prophet, why do you reject that story and find it to be strange? Why do you find it to be strange that Imam Mahdi السلام, spoke in the cradle while Isa السلام, spoke in the cradle? Why do you reject the story that Imam Mahdi السلام, used to teach his companions when he was a toddler and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a prophet and he says, وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ صَبِيَّةِ Zakariya why do you reject everything that has anything to do with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? My brothers, my sisters, and I'm speaking to our brother and sister Sunnis. I want you to think about this for a minute. Really dig deep into your consciousness, your thoughts. You will find the only reason that you reject him is because He's associated with the Shias. Shias, brothers and sisters, and, and my words are to everybody, Shias are mentioned in many traditions, Sunni traditions. Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, reference to Imam Mahdi alayhi salam and that he is one of the children of Fatima alayhi salam and that he will come at the end of times and that he will establish Allah's kingdom on earth. Those references were mentioned by 35 companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 35, excuse me. 33 hadith, they call them mutawatir. Consensus that those hadith are absolutely authentic. 33 of the biggest scholars, Sunni scholars, say that Mahdi, Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, they mention this verbatim. They say that it was Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Askari, the 12th Imam of the Shias. Why isn't he the 12th Imam of all Muslims, brothers and sisters? That's what Hadith says. And as far as Shias are concerned, brothers and sisters, you go 
up to the last time I checked, which was very recently, to the web official website of Saudi Arabia of the Ministry of Islamic Guidance and Endowment. You go to Tafsir al-Quran, Tafsir al-Qurtubi, and other narrations, seven narrations, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about ulaikum khayrul bariyya, khayrul bariyya, they ask the Prophet, this is, these are Sunni hadiths, they ask the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, who are khayrul bariyya, who are the best of creation? At one point it was Imam Ali alayhi salam, he asked, in front of the companions. At other points, the, the companions asked him. When Imam Ali alayhi salam asked him, he said, Ya Ali, hum anta wa shi'atuk. It's you and your Shias. You and your Shias. And when the companions asked, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam points to Ali and he says, Hada wa shi'atuk. This guy, this man, and his Shias. I was in, in, in a, a debate with, with a Sunni gentleman at one point, and he was saying, you know, Shias are kafir, and Shias came way after the Prophet and all that. And he said, you know, no, actually, uh, the Prophet spoke about the Shias, and they were a known group of followers of Imam Ali, alayhi salam, during the lifetime of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salman, Abu Dhar, Maqdad, a special group of, of Shias. They were known as, these are the Shias of Ali. People talk about the Shias of Ali. Everybody identified them and knew who they were. And the Shias of Ali were also the people who followed their path moving forward. So I was debating this with him. And after he listened to the evidence and I showed it to him, gave him the references, he said, you know, you're right. These, these hadith are true, but the Shias are, are us Sunnis, not you guys. Now, you know, I don't know how anybody can call themselves Shias uh, because in, <laughs> if they don't really fulfill the linguistic definition and the Quranic definition of Shia. The linguistic definition of Shia is you follow somebody and you adhere to their way of thinking thinking, uh, and you take their side and you, you stand with them against their enemies. How could people who stand with Yazid or Muawiyah, who fought against Imam Ali I'm not going to talk about others, but let's take Muawiyah and Yazid, who fought against Imam Ali They say that Allah was pleased with Muawiyah, and then they say they are the Shias of Ali. Brothers, you know, you can, you can lie to yourselves, but you cannot lie to Allah. At another instant, there was a gentleman who swore to me that if I can prove to him that the Quran says that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a Shia, that he will become a Shia, and he swore in the Quran, he swore by the name of Allah that if I did that to him, he will agree, he will become a Shia. And I told him, uh, sure, that's easy for us. Uh, do you believe the Quran when it says that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Hanifa Muslim? that he was a follower of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He said, absolutely, that's in the Quran. I said, great, thank you. I said, doesn't the Quran say about Ibrahim alayhi salam? Allah is talking about Nuh and Surah Safat, and then he references Ibrahim. He says, وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ Ibrahim." One of his Shias was Ibrahim. So Allah talks about Ibrahim alayhi salam with great honor that he was a Shia of Nuh. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on the footsteps of Ibrahim alayhi salam, therefore he was a Shia. This man became very furious with me and he disappeared for three days before he came back and gave me his opinion of what he thinks of me. But it doesn't really matter. You know, we, we just have to contemplate the Quran and see what is in the Quran. Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, brothers and sisters, is with us. Like Khidr alayhi salam is still with us. Imam Mahdi alayhi salam sees what you see. He knows the political situation. He knows the env environmental situation that we're in. Imam Mahdi alayhi salam suffers when he sees us disunited. He suffers when he sees his followers. In fact, he suffers for all of humanity because he's not only the Imam of the Shias. Yes, we acknowledge him, but he's the Imam of humankind and jinn. 
He cares about every human being. He cares about his Shias, of course, more because we acknowledge him and we accept him as, as our Imam. Imam Mahdi السلام, gets involved with the events that define our future, like Khidr السلام, did, in ways that we may never understand, or he may explain so, those events to us in the future. So don't think of Imam Mahdi السلام, as somebody who is absent and we don't know where he is. Imam Mahdi السلام, is with us. Like, think about this. Think about your merger. I know, mashallah, a lot of brothers and sisters were honored to meet their merger face to face. But the truth is 98% of Shias hear about their merger. They may even see pictures of him, see him on video, maybe. But they've never encountered the merger. In fact, in the past, they would hear about a merger, they would never meet him. They just hear that a merger lives in such and such city, and these are his opinions, and I need to follow him in whatever he says. Imam Mahdi alayhi salam is more present than our mergers. He cares more about what we do than our mergers because he is the merja of the mergers and he's our merja always. You're guaranteed that Imam Mahdi alayhi salam every year makes it to Hajj. You're guaranteed that Imam Mahdi alayhi salam makes Salah in Masjid al Kufa. You're guaranteed that, the, that Imam Mahdi alayhi salam visits the grave of his grandfather, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his other grandfathers, the Imams Alayhi Wasallam. And when there are events that are existential to us, especially Shias, Imam Mahdi Alayhi Wasallam gets involved in ways that we will never understand. So, brothers and sisters, if you find yourself thinking of and adhering more to the teachings of our mergers, as, as we should love and respect our mergers. But if you find yourself adhering to and thinking more of your merger on a daily basis, more than Imam Mahdi salam, re-examine your thoughts. Every single day, brothers and sisters, make the dua. Every single day. I recommend Salat al-Fajr in your qunut. Allahumma kulli waliyyika al-hujjat ibn al-hasan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abayhi. في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا I'm not going to translate this because I need to wrap this up. We're getting close to the half hour marker. Uh, <clears throat> make this dua for Imam Mahdi عليه السلام. If you think our marjahs, if you think Ayatollah Sistani suffers because of what he sees is happening to the Shias of the world or any of our other marjahs, and they do suffer, they feel a lot of pain for us, rest assured that Imam Mahdi salam, suffers a great deal more with every calamity, every illness that we have, every sin we commit, every disunity that is created, every riba that we make against each other, we make the heart or Imam alayhi salam said. Inshallah, <coughs> next lecture, it probably will be the beginning of the holy month of Ramadan or just about the beginning. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prepare us for the holy month of Ramadan, to make us united, to help humanity this through this pandemic, to make us come out on the other side of this, better human beings, better followers of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, better Shias, for Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. Hada walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.